welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're going to be exploring uh, how architecture impacts us, you know, you specifically. Oh, interesting. And did you know that uh, the average person spends 90% of their time indoors? Really? I had no idea. It's true. Yeah. So, you know, all those buildings we inhabit, they're not just about how they look. Yeah. You know, they actually have a real effect on our brains. Wow. So it kind of unpacked this a little bit. We've got a stack of really interesting research. Um, articles like, uh, let's see, Frontiers, the Embodiment of Architectural Experience. Yeah, okay. And uh, Neuroarchitecture, How the Perception of Our Surroundings Impacts the Brain. Um, and to help guide us through all this, we've got our expert here. Happy to be here. So if you're enjoying these deep dives, by the way, don't forget to uh, like and subscribe to get more fascinating content just like this. Now, uh, one concept that really jumped out at me um, in all this research was this idea of embodied simulation. Embodied simulation. Yeah, it, it sounds kind of complicated, but it's basically the idea that our brains, they react to buildings almost as if we're uh, physically interacting with them. Huh. So, like, imagine walking towards a really narrow doorway. Okay. Yeah. Your brain, it's already kind of preparing your body to squeeze through it, yeah. even before you actually get there. Interesting. So it's like a mental rehearsal for the space. Exactly. Mm. It's wild, right? And this all connects to mirror neurons. I don't know if you're familiar. Exactly. They're the neurons that fire both when we do something and when we see somebody else doing that same thing. Right. So, you know, if we see like a grand staircase or something, our brains might actually be simulating that, like the act of climbing it even if we're just looking at it. Wow, that's pretty amazing. So our brains are constantly engaging with architecture, even on a subconscious level. Totally. And it goes even deeper than that. So there are specific regions in the brain, like the anterior cingulate cortex, the ACC, mm -hmm. and the parahippocampal place area, the PPA. Mm -hmm. These, they light up when we're processing architectural stimuli, like shapes and spaces. So what do those regions do exactly? Well, the ACC that's involved in decision-making and emotional responses. Interesting. And the PPA helps us understand our location in space. So like if you walk into a massive cathedral. Exactly. Your ACC might be processing the uh, the grandeur in the light, giving you that sense of awe, while the PPA is busy mapping out the entire space so you don't get lost. Yeah, and it makes me think about how good architectural design should really help us find our way around like intuitively you know yeah good point like when you're at a museum and there's a really well-placed landmark and you don't get lost right right it's all about creating spaces that make sense to our brains exactly we actually build these mental representations of spaces called cognitive maps cognitive maps yeah and certain architectural features like that distinctive museum landmark they become like anchors in those maps anchors so when a building is well designed, it basically guides us from one anchor to the next without us even thinking about it. Oh, that's really interesting. So by like designing with these cognitive maps in mind, architects could help people navigate, especially in places like um, hospitals. Absolutely. Which could be like really helpful for patients and staff who are already stressed out. For sure. Yeah. And speaking of stress, there's this whole other fascinating side to neuroarchitecture how light and color can like totally impact our mood and well-being. Oh yeah, light and color are huge. Right, I was reading that natural light, it can actually reduce stress and even like improve sleep quality. It's true. But then on the flip side, if you get too much artificial light, especially at night, right. it can mess with your sleep. Makes you wonder how much our surroundings are messing with us without us realizing it, you know? It's a bit and unsettling when you think about it. Like how much control does our environment have over us? Yeah. Makes yeah. you think. It does. It really is amazing uh, how something like like light, you know, something so basic can have such a big impact on us, like our whole well-being. Yeah. And it's not just about like how much light there is, you know. It's also about the the quality of the light and like when we get it. Yeah. It's like our bodies are they're attuned to these natural rhythms. Yeah. You know. Right. Yeah. And when we mess those up with like artificial light, it throws everything off. Exactly. Our uh, our circadian rhythms, you know, the ones that control our sleep-wake cycles, mm. those are really influenced by light. Like getting enough sunlight during the day, it helps keep those rhythms on track, which means better sleep and, you know, better health overall. So you're saying like architects could design buildings that would help people be healthier mm. just by using natural light in the right way. That's the idea. Huh. That's pretty powerful.
It is. And, you know, going back to those uh, cognitive maps we were talking about earlier, yeah. they're not just for like uh, individual buildings. Like our brains can actually create mental maps of like whole cities. Yeah. Wait, you mean like my brain has like a map of like all of London in it mm -hmm. or New York? That seems like a lot of information. It is a lot, but our brains are pretty good at adapting. Yeah. You know, think about when you when you visit a new city, okay. it might be overwhelming at first, yeah. right? But then as you explore, you start to like recognize landmarks and your brain slowly starts to build a cognitive map so you can like find your way around more easily. Oh yeah, that's so true. I remember when I went to Tokyo for the first time, I like totally lost. Mm -hmm. But then after a few days, I started to you know feel more comfortable getting around. Do you think um, growing up in a city with like a really complex layout, you know, with winding streets and alleyways and stuff. Do you think that could actually make you better at spatial reasoning? It's an interesting question. The researchers are actually starting to look into that. And there's some some early evidence that um, that living in environments that kind of challenge our spatial skills might lead to better navigation skills later on. But uh, more research is definitely needed. Huh. I'd be really curious to see what they find out. But uh, speaking of navigating tricky environments, let's talk about... Um, the impact of architecture on people with cognitive impairments, like uh, like dementia. Okay. I know we touched on this a little bit before, but I think it's worth you know diving a little deeper. Yeah. Because a confusing layout that can be incredibly disorienting. Right. Especially for someone with dementia. Yeah, absolutely. It can even like increase their anxiety and agitation. Right. But well designed spaces, you know, they can make a huge difference. So how can architects design spaces that are better for people with dementia? Well, there are a lot of different strategies. For example, they can use like really clear signage, mm -hmm. you know, and color palettes that are really distinctive. So it's easier to find your way around. Makes sense. And uh, incorporating things that are familiar, you know, objects and stuff mm. and creating a sense of like visual continuity that can help reduce confusion and just kind of promote a sense of calm. Wow. It's amazing how even these small design choices can have such a big impact. Yeah. It's like it's not just about making things pretty. Mm -hmm. It's about creating environments that really like support people and and how they're feeling, you know? Exactly. And it's not, you know, it's not just about making spaces easier to navigate either. It's also mm -hmm. about making them stimulating, you know, and engaging. Okay. For example, you can use natural elements like uh like plants and sunlight that can help to improve mood and reduce agitation. Yeah, bringing the outdoors in. Yeah. That's got to be good for everybody. Right. Especially people who are dealing with cognitive stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like creating a little oasis of calm in a place that could be like really overwhelming. That's a great way to put it. And speaking of bringing the outdoors in, you know, light. Yeah. It plays a really like critical role in regulating our circadian rhythms. Right. Which, you know, that affects our sleep, hormones, mood, all sorts of things. Right. We were talking about how getting enough sunlight during the day is important. But um, I'm curious about the like the specifics. Mm -hmm. How does light actually like affect our brains? Well, different wavelengths of light have different effects. Oh, interesting. For example, blue light, you know, the kind you get from sunlight, it actually suppresses the production of melatonin. Melatonin. Which is the hormone that helps us sleep. Oh, right. So that's why being out in the sun during the day, it makes you feel more awake. So that's why it's good to get sunlight first thing in the morning. Exactly. Yeah. It helps to, like, reset your internal clock. But then, you know, if you're exposed to blue light from, say, like, electronic devices at night, uh -huh. that can mess with your sleep because it basically tricks your brain into think it's still daytime, so it stops producing melatonin when you actually need it. It's like we're fighting against our own biology when we stay up late on our phones. In a way, yeah. And this is where architecture can really come in. By designing spaces that, you know, maximize natural light during the day and minimize artificial light at night, especially blue light, Yeah, we can create environments that actually support healthy circadian rhythms. So architects could like design buildings that help people sleep better. Potentially. Yeah. That's that's pretty wild. It is. It shows how interconnected our biology is with the, you know, the places we inhabit. Yeah. And it's not just about natural light either. Artificial light can be used strategically too to kind of influence our mood and behavior. Oh, really? How so? Well, think about the lighting in different places, like yeah. uh, warm, dim lighting in a restaurant. Okay. That can create a relaxing atmosphere. Yeah. But then bright, cool lighting in a store can make the products look, you know, more exciting and appealing. It's all about using light to evoke 
certain responses. Makes sense. It's like lighting is its own language that architects can use to like shape our experiences in a space. Yeah. And speaking of influencing experiences, what about color? Yeah. You know how certain colors can like make you feel certain ways? Mm -hmm. Is there like a scientific basis for that? Absolutely. Color has a powerful effect on us, you know, our emotions and how we behave. Mm -hmm. And those associations aren't just cultural. They're they're rooted in our biology. Different colors actually stimulate different parts of our brain. Whoa, really? So it's not just that we've learned to associate like red with anger or blue with calmness. It's that our brains are actually wired to respond to colors in certain ways. Exactly. So, for instance, blue light actually stimulates the production of melatonin. Oh, right, right. Which helps us relax and fall asleep. That's one reason why blue is often used in spaces where you want a sense of, you know, peace and quiet, like bedrooms or or hospitals. That's probably why I always feel so calm in blue rooms, like my brain's getting a dose of melatonin just from looking at the walls. Could be. What about other colors? Yeah, what about them? Well, research has shown that green, uh, it can promote concentration and focus. Interesting. That's why it's often used in, you know, schools and offices. And it's also been shown to reduce stress and anxiety. I've always found green to be a really like calming and refreshing color. Yeah. I can definitely see how it could help you focus. It's like um like being surrounded by nature, even if you're inside. <laughs> that's a great analogy. And then there's yellow. You know, it's a color that's often associated with um, optimism and creativity. Yeah, yeah. It's frequently used in uh, learning environments because it's been shown to potentially um, improve memory and concentration. Yellow is such a, a, bright, a bright and cheerful color. Like it's hard not to feel at least a little bit optimistic when you see it. Right. And then there's orange. It's a warm and inviting color. It's often used in social spaces like uh, restaurants and living rooms. I love orange. It always makes me feel like happy and energetic. It's a very social color. It's been shown to um, stimulate appetite and conversation. Wow, really? That's yeah. fascinating. It is. So, you know, when you're choosing colors for your home or your office or whatever, it's important to think about not just what you like, you know, what colors you like, but mm -hmm. also how those colors might be affecting you psychologically. It's like we're designing our own emotional landscapes just through the colors we choose. That's a great way to put it. Color is a powerful tool. It can be used to create certain moods, you know, to enhance the way a space functions mm. and even to improve our, our overall well-being. It's incredible to think about how all these different things like like light and color and uh, the way a space is laid out, how they all work together to shape how we experience a place. It's like architects are like choreographing a whole symphony of senses. That's a beautiful analogy. And, you know, as we learn more about the brain and how it responds to all these things, you know, our surroundings, mm. we're getting a much deeper understanding of how much of an impact architecture really has on our lives. This has been uh, this has been such an eye opening conversation. I'm glad to hear that. I feel like I'm seeing architecture in a, a whole new light now, literally. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. And uh, luckily for us, we have another part of our deep dive to go. We do. So we can keep exploring all this. Yes. In the final part, we're going to delve into the future of neuroarchitecture. We'll talk about some of the latest trends and, um, you know, the ethical side of things. Like, what are the implications of designing spaces that can actually influence our brains? Right. That's a big one. It is. And we'll also talk about the potential for this field to really change the way we live and work and just interact with the world around us. Sounds fascinating. Yeah. Welcome back to the deep dive. You know, it's really amazing how much we've learned about like the impact architecture has on our brains. It is, yeah. It's pretty remarkable how much our surroundings can shape, you know, how we think, how we feel, even our health. So before we wrap things up, I'm really curious to hear like what you think about the future of all this. The future of neuroarchitecture. Yeah, like what are some of the exciting things you see happening in the field? Well, one trend that I think has a ton of potential is um, what's called biophilic design. Biophilic design. I've heard that term before, but I don't really know what it means. It's something about bringing nature into buildings, right? Exactly. It's about incorporating natural elements like plants, sunlight, you know, natural materials, even things like water features into the built environment. So it's like more than just adding a few potted plants to your office. It's really about like integrating nature into the design itself. Yeah, precisely. And the benefits go way beyond just making a space look nicer. Studies have shown that being exposed to nature can actually reduce stress levels, improve people's moods, boost creativity, even enhance cognitive function. Well, that makes sense, right? <laughs>
We've been talking about how light and color can impact our well-being, and it seems like biophilic design is taking that to a whole other level. It really is. And I think it's especially important now, you know? Yeah. Because so many of us spend so much time in cities kind of cut off from the natural world. Yeah, totally. So it's like we're bringing the good stuff from nature into the places where we spend most of our time. That's the idea. I love it. What else? What other trends are you seeing in neuroarchitecture? Another really interesting development is the use of... Um, virtual reality in architectural design. Oh, wow. VR. That's getting big in like every field these days. How are architects using it? Well, it allows them to create these really immersive experiences, you know, mm -hmm. so clients can actually like walk through a space and interact with it before it's even built. So instead of just looking at blueprints or those like 3D models on a computer screen, you can actually experience what it would be like to be in the space. Exactly. And that can be super helpful for making design decisions, especially for, you know, big projects like hospitals or schools. Yeah, I can see how that would be useful, especially for designing spaces for people with like specific needs. Absolutely. VR can actually simulate all sorts of sensory experiences. So you could use it to like see what it's like to navigate a building if you have a visual impairment Yeah. or to experience how a space might feel if you're, you know, sensitive to sound. That's incredible. Mm. So VR could help architects design buildings that are truly inclusive, mm. you know, places that work for everyone. I think so. Yeah. And as the technology gets even better, I think we're going to see even more amazing uses for it in architectural design. It's pretty exciting to think about. But of course, you know, with any new technology, there are always ethical questions that come up. So what are some of the like ethical challenges of designing buildings that can actually, you know, affect people's brains? That's a great question. And it's something we have to think carefully about. I think one of the biggest concerns is the potential for manipulation. Like if we know how design affects our brains, could someone use that knowledge to like make us do things we don't want to do? That's the worry. Yeah. So, for example, could a store use like lighting or color to trick people into buying more stuff. It's possible. So we need to make sure we have like clear ethical guidelines for how neuroarchitecture is used. We want to make sure it's not used to like exploit people or take advantage of them. Right. Absolutely. Are there any other like social implications we should be thinking about? Yeah. I think it's really important to make sure that the benefits of neuroarchitecture are available to everyone, not just people who can, you know, afford it. Yeah, that makes sense. Imagine a world where only rich people have access to like homes and workspaces yeah. that are designed to make them feel better and think more clearly. That would be awful. That would yeah. just make the gap between the rich and poor even bigger. Exactly. Like any powerful tool right? yeah. it can be used for good or for bad. It's up to us to make sure we use this knowledge responsibly. I agree. Neuroarchitecture has so much potential but we have to proceed carefully and thoughtfully, and we have to make sure it's used to create a fairer and more just world for everyone. That's a great point. Well, as we wrap up our deep dive into neuroarchitecture, I have to say, I'm feeling kind of like awestruck by all of this, but also a little bit well, wary, I guess. I understand. It's amazing to learn about how much our environment can affect us, but it's also a little bit scary to realize how much we're influenced by things we might not even be aware of. I get it, right. but I think ultimately knowledge is power, right? Right. The more we understand about how our brains respond to, to our surroundings, the better we can design spaces that actually help us thrive. So what can our listeners do, you know, to apply all this knowledge in their own lives? I think the most important thing is just to pay attention. Pay attention to how different spaces make you feel. Okay. Notice how light affects you, how color affects you, even just the way a room is laid out. Mm -hmm. Think about how you could bring more natural elements into your home or your office. So it's all about being more mindful of the spaces we're in, basically. Exactly. And if you're thinking about, you know, redesigning your home or your workplace or even just choosing a new apartment, consider talking to an architect who specializes in neuroarchitecture. They can help you create a space that not only meets your practical needs, but also supports your mental and emotional well-being. That's great advice. Well, to all our listeners out there, we hope you enjoyed this deep dive into neuroarchitecture as much as we did. It's a really fascinating field, and it's constantly changing as new research comes out. So stay curious, keep exploring, and... Um, if you like this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to The Deep Dive for more amazing explorations into the world of science and culture. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for being here and everyone listening. Until next time. 